Welcome to The Spawn Chunks, episode number 263 for Monday, September 18th, 2023. My name is Johnny, but the internet knows me as Pixorifs, and joining me is a freshly empowered Joel Duggan. Hi, Joel. Hello. I will refrain from any He-Man jokes here. <laughs> Well I experienced a very large storm this weekend, which knocked out my power. And if you'd like to hear more about that, you can listen to the render distance where I go over that, as well as some of the things that I've been watching once the power was returned. And we do that every single week. The render distance is an extended version of the podcast, and it is available to our patrons at patreon.com slash the spun chunks. You support the show and you get some excellent value back to you in the uh, form of extended audio. And some of that stuff includes the Chunk Mail Dispenser, a special email only episode. That's going to be today, actually. We also do the monthly Minecraft Hangout that's coming later on this month, usually the last Saturday of the month. And I snuck a peek through the um, base building section of our Discord, and I'm really looking forward to this month because there's some cool stuff happening in there. We also have a quarterly hangout coming up in October, hopefully uh, ahead of the Minecraft Live stuff that's happening in October as well. And outside of power outages, there is no scheduled change for the foreseeable future. So outside of weather happening in the Maritimes, we should be uh, happening on Monday from here on out. Yes, I'm very excited to talk a little bit more about the Minecraft Live stuff in the news. But first of all, let's uh, check out what's new in our Minecraft Lives. And I imagine having been cut off this weekend, you don't have a whole lot to recap. But uh, what's new on the Citadel? So you're right. I, I did not get a lot done. I was focused on my little break outside of West Hill in the West Hill Valley, where I am building a tiered wheat farm along the uh, West Hill River. I basically finished up the tiers, started planting the wheat, and then on Saturday I began the process of changing the cobblestone walls that surround the farm uh, into something more detailed where I'm swapping out block types, I'm adding in parts that have been broken down with stairs, slabs on top for height differences. Really enjoy using pressure plates on this to also make it feel like the pieces have either fallen off or you know different types of stone were used. And then something I started doing in the other wheat farm that's closer to the main road, which is taking pieces of the wall that have either crumbled away completely and they've been replaced, but they've been replaced with wood and fences. So like kind of as technology got better in the medieval times, it was easier and faster to patch things with wood fences, you know, rather than just adding more stonework to it. So it also provides some interesting, you know, visuals and breaks up all the gray in, in the wall. And I was using things like uh, moss, moss carpet, azalea bushes, adding in some grass. Uh, I still feel like I need to maybe add a little bit more grass along the wall. It feels a little bit harsh when it goes right from the wall to the dirt road on the East Farm Road. And it's still very much a work in progress. Uh, the weed is still growing. The road texture has not been touched at all. And uh, things like there's a pond in the middle of the field that's got an irrigation ditch that's kind of running down to the river. None of that has been textured. There's no like plants and grass and nothing around in there. The only thing that's been planned out, uh, which is something I like to do with these wheat farms or any farm that I'm doing really, is to try to make them functional. So rather than just planting an entire block or entire like kidney bean shape of wheat, I actually divide them into rows. And to make it more interesting and make the farm look more full, I put those rows on angles. And so there's like a little zigzag of coarse dirt that goes between kind of like a double row of wheat and you repeat that process. And so it looks really cool from above because you it, you end up seeing like the rows of sown wheat, which look really, really cool and very organized. It's very satisfying. And then uh, what really helps is that on the main road, when you're approaching the town, this now blankets the entire east bank of the West Hill River. And because the angle of those rows of wheat is perpendicular to the road, you're not looking down the empty rows. You're looking at the walls of wheat. So it looks like a very full field. And only every once in a while do you get a glimpse of like, oh, there's like a row down there. Like I could walk down that if I wanted to. And uh, and yeah, so that's that's kind of where I am with it. I have not done any details about the dirt roads in amongst the, the farm uh, I haven't added things like barrels or any kind of functional areas. There's no carts or anything like that. No gates. I've, I think I still have scaffolding in some places, place holding like, put a gate here, Joel, don't forget. So um, it's it's very much uh, in the process of being finished because, of course, I got cut off kind of midstream on on Saturday, uh, which is, I, you know, I mentioned before, I, I'm really frustrating because I was like, I was in the groove. I had an inventory absolutely full of stuff. One of those builds where 
you want all the things in your inventory, but you keep on picking up extra stuff. And so like, you're just constantly emptying out those last two slots to try to get room for things. Yeah. It really is pushing my patience with the, the Minecraft inventory as it is. But, um, you get all that stuff going and organizing. you get in this flow of like, I'm just going to work my way organically down this wall, kind of like making it look and feel quote unquote the right way. And then the power goes out and you're like, oh man, <laughs> I really, I'm, it's going to be hard to get back in that groove when I get back into it. But I mean, at least the inventory is exactly where I left it. Like that hasn't changed. So I'll have all the block palette already ready to go. I just have to kind of walk along the wall once or twice and be like, okay, this is what I was doing. This is how I was doing the fences. And this is, how I was handling the bushes and stuff like that. But do you, do you, does that ever happen to you? Like, do you ever get in like a, I don't want to call it like a Zen flow, but like a creative flow of doing something. And then doesn't necessarily have to be a power outage, but like something in life, you know, dinner, you know, phone call, something kind of interrupts you and you have to kind of like work your way back into it. Yeah. It happens to me all the time. And uh, honestly, stuff like in Minecraft can break me out of it, which is why I have oh, developed yeah. such a frequent routine of chopping wood and gathering resources every week because I really hate being interrupted in the middle of a build by running out of a certain resource and needing to go and make more of it, which yes. can be a very time-consuming yeah. activity. Like if you look at a, a large build where you want to build with a lot of spruce wood and it turns out you haven't got enough logs to break down into planks for all of the slabs and stairs for details or whatever, then you have to go and farm a couple of spruce trees and that just takes you out of the creative flow of it. So I really try and, I, I try and treat like mining and gathering resources and building as two very distinct separate activities and one is not happening while the other happens ideally yeah uh, resources are something that i've definitely had bring my my creative flow to a grinding halt i i tend to take stock before i start something these days so i can use like oh all right before we start today i was in the mood to start building but i really have to take like 15 minutes and chop down like you know a half dozen spruce trees stuff like that i use that as a cool opportunity to talk to chat but i imagine that's probably what you do for the entire tuesday stream like <laughs> pretty much a great opportunity to do <laughs> yes. the, the whole thing there yeah yeah uh i i think that the other thing that would bug me in minecraft would be like a creeper explosion like something that has destroyed something and you need to fix it right away because one it's like a finished area that's been broken but two like you need to fix it because like right now you remember what it looks like <laughs> yeah cool. yeah yeah so you have to make the adjustments immediately otherwise you're it's just not going to look the same and if you haven't that, uh, toggled that game rule that encourages creepers to drop 100 percent of the blocks they destroy then you're usually yes. going back for more dirt even just to fill in a hole in the ground because you don't want to leave it all hollow and you know fall through it next time you dig up a bit of the terrain or something yeah yeah so i for me i i do want to get back to this i i need to move forward and finish the town i just i've noticed as i've been walking back and forth when i recharge my elytra or you know my gear that the valley was feeling that it hadn't been touched as as much as the other parts so uh, this is a very straightforward thing something i like about these while they are time consuming the wheat fields are i'll call them easy compared to other things that i do and and i think that that it's a nice not stress relief, but it's a nice kind of like breath of, it's like for me when I return to drawing, you know, like just rather than doing like digital stuff and painting and graphic design layout, which I am I have become good at, but it's not second nature to me. Drawing is second nature to me. And so when I do stuff like this in Minecraft, the organic kind of like, I don't really need this to be perfect. I can kind of adjust the landscape as I need the farm to be bigger. Uh, I find that relaxing compared to the jigsaw puzzle in some cases that has been building things in West Hill where you've got like, you can't go any farther because there's a river there or there's a build from last year that you don't want to move. So like you're kind of stuck mm -hmm. and that can give you some creative challenges and, and bear really interesting, you know, fruit in terms of, you know, creative choices, but it's also, I like, it's, I don't want to say it's not relaxing, but it's, it's not as intuitive as doing like a wheat field is, I think. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So what have you been up to on the survival guide this week? I've had somewhat of an eclectic week, which is largely inspired by needing to work on the build for my storage room. It's large enough that I want to design it in creative, first of all, so I'm not like mismeasuring things. And I wanted to get like a good notion of the scale that I was building on. 
Uh, so I don't really have any screenshots to show for that because I haven't really started doing that in survival yet. I've just been sketching it out in creative. And it's going to be a large thing. Like, each row of my storage system is uh, 16 storage modules wide, and it's arranged in a plus shape. So it all kind of spans out from a centralized section where mm -hmm. there's a little bit more manual storage and potentially staircases up to a second level and i'm trying to keep it in this rustic style that i've already established with my starter houses i don't want it to look completely different from those or just like this weird alien building that's been plopped down in there so uh yeah it's going with kind of timber frames and wood walls and a bit of green terracotta is kind of one of the things i plan on working into the the, the facade of the build so I needed to set up cactus farms and I decided to farm bamboo at the same time because those were getting set up around my sugarcane farm and I just had a patch of bamboo growing naturally next to the area where I normally farm wood. But of course bamboo is a little different and so I set those up. Um, I went to a swamp in the hope of finding a witch hut uh, but pivoted into frog breeding while I was there and having a basalt delta biome as your nether spawn makes for some good early game frog light farming. So in the process of finding other stuff to do to make up episodes while I was designing this build in creative, I, you know, happened to stumble into almost the uh, the frog breeding stuff. I actually started that episode thinking I'm going to go out and find a pillager outpost and start talking about crossbows and pillager raids and that kind of stuff, but I couldn't find an outpost and I stumbled upon a swamp in the process. So I thought, okay, well, we'll pivot here and we'll do frogs instead. Um, so I've got a bunch of those cheerful guys uh, hanging around my base now. A few of them moved into the nether where I've just flattened an area and around the area where I pop out into the nether from my base, there was always a couple of magma cubes just kind of hanging around. Uh, so I figured, you know, I'll just chop a few of them down to size. The frogs will eat them. I'll pick up frog lights passively. And then potentially what I'm going to do in the fullness of time once I build out a more organized nether hub is have a magma cube, you know, a naturally spawned basalt delta frog light farm built into the floor, maybe with like a glass floor so that nothing spawns on top of it, but you can see the level below and they're all being lured in by an iron golem, kind of in a similar setup to what I had in Empires Season 2, where the frogs can just hop around in a hole. The magma cubes are getting broken down by um, cubes of powder snow inside of there, and then eventually all of that gets picked up, and my nether hub is also a farm. Uh, so I figured I would do that. We'll probably set one of those up around the basalt delta, um, not the basalt delta, the piglin bastion, magma cube spawner at some stage as well but i think it's kind of nice to uh, to have the options of both and i'm sure i'll be going in and out of that portal at the uh the the sort of central area of my nether hub quite frequently i was about to say i'm a little embarrassed i've not thought of putting a farm in a nether hub of like sorts because you're you're there so often you know it's, it's yeah if you're using the nether at all that's probably the the most frequently traveled area and to have a farm of any kind that's that's close enough to be loaded it wouldn't have to be like in the actual floor but i mean it's brilliant that that yours is uh or will be and i think that that's that's really smart i need to do more with farms like that in playable areas because right now with with west hill i mean like i think i'd set up some temporary sugarcane farms here and there but like every time i need something i have to go to other places and i'm lucky in that there's other people playing on the server in different areas and loading different things because otherwise we wouldn't have any supplies because a lot of our main shared farms are in dartmouth meadows and everybody on the server has kind of moved on from there and so I'm going to have to start creating my own farms in other areas and make sure that I do that in places where I'm going to be frequently playing and and that's going to be a, a challenge yeah and and the the thing I went with from the very beginning of this series was I'm building a sugarcane farm right next to my house basically like I'm I'm setting up all of these farms to be relatively close to areas where I know I'll be playing frequently um, and the, the exception to that being the iron farm, because that will operate in the spawn chunks, but I've not had a chance to spread out across this world yet, really. Like, I've I've been to a couple of places and always brought stuff back to a central location. I have a geode farm that's way further away, so I don't go there super often because I have to make sure that area is loaded, but I think it's still within range of my skeleton spawner, so maybe while I'm there the crystals are growing. But uh, yeah, the sort of unified idea of where to farm everything is something that I'll be investigating a little bit more in the future of this series, probably setting up a more dedicated industrial area somewhere else in the world, but one which has got a ton of farms that are all active while you're there, is kind of the uh, the idea. 
Um, in the meantime, whilst I was looking for other subjects to touch on, uh, I revisited tridents and crossbows. And I've got a couple of revised thoughts on them, to be honest, because having now spent a bit more time with crossbows and using uh, firework arrows from them, um, those are actually fairly powerful if you add more firework stars to the fireworks while you're making them, which can get a bit expensive, obviously, if you don't have a great deal of gunpowder. But once you're farming gunpowder, crossbows and fireworks can be a pretty lethal combination. And then I find that Riptide on a Trident actually feels like it will be more useful now, and channeling possibly even the same, because when they were first introduced, we still had that thing where sleeping would reset the weather cycle, so if you just slept every time it got dark, you never really saw rain in Minecraft. And now, as of, I think, 1.18, maybe the wild update, I forget which, but um, they changed it so that sleeping no longer resets the weather unless the weather is active at the time, right? So it'll stop rain if it's raining when you sleep, but it won't then prevent rain from happening for an additional couple of days. And so it rains in my world a lot more, which isn't my favorite thing in terms of making videos, but it does mean that anytime you'd want to use Riptide, you are not shooting yourself in the foot by sleeping frequently. And I actually got to demonstrate Riptide a couple of times in this video without having to wait, you know, what felt like an hour for the rain to happen. <laughs> um, I didn't get channeling yet, so I didn't have a chance to uh, wait around for a thunderstorm to happen, but I, I did like, you know, I, I appreciated the fact that Riptide now feels like a little bit more balanced gameplay wise purely from the fact that they've adjusted the way players resetting the weather cycle works I feel your pain I feel like it just rains all the time on the Citadel <laughs> yeah and I, I I know it's because the game changed the rule but it just it does feel like it happens far too often the thing that I find frustrating is that a thunderstorm uh very obvious when it is thunder and lightning in Minecraft but I have found that there have been thunderstorms or rain that is designated as a thunderstorm that I can sleep through, but I don't know that because there's no thunder and lightning happening. Yeah. And so very often when it's raining, if I happen to be near my bed, I'll just try it just to see. Yeah. Because sometimes I'm right. It's like, oh, it's a thunderstorm. Sweet. Uh, other times it gets very, very dark. And it depends, I guess, on the time of day if it's raining. If it's raining late in the day and if it's a thunderstorm, regardless of any thunder and lightning, you go, oh, well, no, this is black. Like, this is not just gray. This is really dark for, you know, midday still or, or mid-afternoon in Minecraft. And so I'll go and I'll test the sleep. And sure enough, because it's that dark, I, I called it and it was a thunderstorm. But yeah, I, I'm with you. I don't, you know, I don't mess around with tridents or crossbows at all. I, uh, I use fireworks for flying. So I make them just kind of like readily you know because we have a, a a creeper farm that refresh my memory do you have a creeper farm or a general mob farm on this survival guide world not yet um i have a skeleton okay. spawner and that's what i've been using for xp i've been killing creepers most of the time when i see them so i have gunpowder but not having focused on getting to the end and acquiring a elytra i've not needed firework rockets really for anything else yet and right. you know i've not really crafted that much tnt either so same thing i don't really need gunpowder in vast quantities right now in fact the most i think i've used it for throughout this series has been crafting splash potions so i think once i've done that and that's coming up fairly soon i think if if not this week then next week i will probably be going to the end um after that i'll be looking into making a general mob farm purely for the supply of fireworks being necessary yeah, to get around um but then yeah like riptide once i've got elytra will also be a pretty viable way of moving and i'm pretty sure it's the fastest you can travel because riptide really does boost you uh so yeah i am kind of interested in seeing how that changes the way we uh we travel around but for now it's a little too deadly <laughs> i'm getting a little bit too much lift and luckily i have feather falling on my boots but it can be uh, a little bit dangerous getting around that way it's really interesting how weather might then influence what you end up doing as a task. So maybe not for your video, but like say you're doing a stream, you know, you're doing your, your resource collection stream and one of these, like your geode and your, your skeleton farm may be a little bit farther away and it starts to rain. You go, oh, hey, I'll use Riptide and I'll go there right now because I can travel like at breakneck speeds yeah. because of the weather. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it, it's interesting how that might influence things, you know, especially if you're, you know, you're working on potentially doing any kind of you know guardian builds or you know raiding an ocean monument like that kind of stuff with raining and riptide and all those things that i don't really explore that much just because i've been in in this west hill build for almost three years it's it's one of those things that i'm looking forward to almost rediscovering you know when i move on to do other things and that it might be fun to 
try different modes of getting around or work in different areas where that kind of thing is going to be more viable uh, or work with the theme of what I'm building if it's going to be, you know, part of that, not RPG experience, but like just that kind of getting around and doing those things, getting to different places with different methods, maybe even making a mini game, like all the different things that I see um, used with these different mobility techniques in, in Minecraft that I've not taken advantage of. Yeah, it's a versatile game. There's there's a lot of stuff that we don't use most of the time because it's not as reliable every single time. Like, it's not always a utility, but there are definitely moments where it can shine. So looking forward to finding some more of those. In the meantime, let's move on into the news for this week. And the main news is that Minecraft Live is returning for 2023. We'll have a link to the Minecraft.net article where this was officially announced. There's also, I believe, a YouTube video, sort of a trailer for Minecraft Live returning. It'll be back on October 15th, when I believe uh, Joel and I will probably be doing what we've done in previous years and restreaming it uh, alongside our own commentary on Twitch, probably on my Twitch channel, but stay tuned for future announcements about that. The one big thing we know about it is that the mob vote is returning. A mob vote will be allowing players to vote for one of three mobs to be added to the next major update. Candidates for the mob vote will be presented in early October, so stay tuned for more information about those. The voting is going to open a little earlier and close a little later, so voting is going to open on 1pm uh, Eastern Daylight Time on Friday, October 13th, and close at 1.15pm Eastern Daylight Time on Sunday, October 15th, so right when the Minecraft Live broadcast is supposed to begin. Community can cast their vote within Minecraft itself, as they did last year, by joining a live event server on Minecraft Bedrock Edition, but it will also be possible to vote via Minecraft.net or the Minecraft Launcher. Minecraft Java Edition 1.20.2 pre-release 3 and Release Candidate 1 were released this week. Uh, there were three bug fixes in pre-3 mainly that the record attribute was stripped from records with no components. That's now been fixed, along with players sitting lower in minecarts and hoglins being unable to breed. In release candidate 1 for 1.20.2, there was one major change that also accounted for a bug fix. The positions that all entities ride on minecarts has been adjusted to make a little bit more sense, and the corresponding bug fix is that mobs now sit too high in minecarts. There was also a trade rebalance loot table with the wrong type that has now been fixed as well. And the full release of 1.20.2 should arrive this week, according to the latest release candidate changelog, and it will not include the updates to villagers which have been in the experimental phase during recent 1.20.2 snapshots. The deadline for Mojang account migration is tomorrow, September 19th. Quote, starting September 19th, 2023 at 11 a.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Central Eastern Standard Time, unmigrated Mojang accounts will not be able to sign in to Minecraft.net or the Minecraft launcher to migrate. We're doing this to ensure that everyone is playing using accounts with improved security and player safety. In addition, starting September 19th, 2023, Minecraft support will no longer be able to assist in any MSA migration related tickets. So a good idea to uh, nudge your friends who haven't played Minecraft for a while and just make sure they're aware of this because, yeah, it does seem like it's going to be a little difficult to migrate before that. But uh, I'm pretty sure most of the folks who've <laughs> listened to this podcast will be fairly familiar with account migration and will have done it already. So hopefully everyone's got that particular box ticked and can get excited as we are for Minecraft Live. I'm kind of wondering if we're getting the same approach we got last year with no update name announcement, but maybe some hints at a theme and a look at any of the features that are finished enough to appear in snapshots and tests, because they released a snapshot for the 1.20 features more or less immediately after Minecraft Live last year, right? They, they announced it like and said, we're going to be giving you a snapshot this week. Uh, so who knows, like by, by the middle of October, we might be talking about some uh, some brand new features again. Which would be very exciting. I, I'm i on board for, you know, Minecraft Live in its current iteration. I felt like last year was a tight production. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like they had a lot to cover. The devs were very candid. And despite the, the fact that they didn't really have a title for us, I think that they still kind of were quite straight up about what they were planning. And I liked the balance between like, hey, we've got this idea. It's pretty solid. We are sure it's going to be in there. So we're going to tell you about it now. There are also things that we're still working on that we're just not going to mention because we don't want to overpromise. Uh, and also things like, we're just not sure. Like, we like this idea, but we're just not sure if this is the update for that. You know, And I, I think that I, I like that kind of presentation as well as setting expectations for, you know, we don't want to 
overtax the crew and we want to make sure that this is a doable you know deliverable update and i think it was also when they announced the changes from only major updates to also including minor updates i'm pretty yeah. sure that was last year mm -hmm. at minecraft live and so we have to remember that they're like while they could be announcing big features coming for the next major update they could also be announcing some things that are coming to minor updates along the way and they might be able to differentiate those for us and that would be great because i think that will help players that like get excited for all the new features in the new big announcement, but then go like, man, who knows when that's coming? But if they announce both, if they announce big features for the new, like full release, and then also say, hey, by the way, in the meantime, we're going to have a bunch of things that we're looking at coming to these minor releases. And here are some of those ideas. I'd be totally down for that. Yeah. Um, I I felt like Trails and Tales was a difficult update to name. And so I feel like they maybe didn't even have a name picked out last year. Whereas if they have a name this year, I hope they just tell us if they know it's going to be a theme and they know they've got the name picked out because it was just easier. I, I hope that they tell us because they know and don't hold it back arbitrarily just because that's what they did last year. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. If, if yeah. they know what's happening and they like if they know the theme and they know the name, just tell us don't like trickle feed that kind of stuff i'd rather just know because i think that opens up bigger conversations within the player base be like oh it's a update for x and you're like oh okay then everybody can stop grasping at straws and the conversation can be a little bit more focused which i think would be good for mojang feedback too right yeah i, th I think the the difference is that last year they were talking about this being an update that was really collaborative with the community and it's whether or not they continue that approach and say well right we want to hear a few suggestions on what we should name this update or if it's like we're going to update the end dimension so we're probably going to call it the end update <laughs> right like right. I, yeah and, and like like the nether update was 116 you know um and that's definitely where the community sent community sentiment has lined for the last little while like people have been focused on updates for the end or updates to inventory management and storage you even mentioned earlier in the podcast that you were kind of getting to the point where you're getting frustrated with with inventory yeah. management stuff um potentially the portal that appears at the center of ancient cities is still one of those mysteries that we expect there to be some expansion on in future or you know some some kind of hints at least um but it remains to be seen what direction mojang are going to take this update there have been virtually no hints or leaks or anything like that and we don't know exactly when the team starts planning updates ahead of them actually being developed because if you imagine there's obviously a a brainstorming process and a drafting process and then concept art and then all of these different stages before it even gets as far as okay this is all approved now let's try and code it and let's model stuff and let's design textures and like the actual development and design of the of the update could be happening several years after the update has been pitched and confirmed so we're not sure whether community requests are really going to factor in to where they are with with the development of this particular update but we will see they have been talking about end updates in previous interviews and stuff like that so we know that that stuff is on their radar but i i want to as usual encourage people to uh you know maybe stay your expectations a little bit and i think that's also one of the reasons why they didn't announce the update name immediately last year is because in previous years there had been a great deal of speculation about the breadth of an update and how mm, it, interesting mm -hmm. it could be i'm thinking specifically of the wild update here and then there was a lot of disappointment and a little backlash over how focused the wild update seemed to be when the name seemed to promise the idea of you know changing a lot more of the world in the meantime, if it is an end update, then they know it's going to be focused on the end and you don't really need to say much more than that because that that's one dimension with a very sort of straightforward theme to it right now. You know, we'll we'll see. We'll see what uh, what they've got in mind, but I'm certainly happy to be looking forward to Minecraft Live again. Speaking of player feedback, are we excited about another mob vote this year? Honestly, I think it's still a good thing that they happen because it is once again an opportunity for the community to have their say about stuff and everybody loves a moan. <laughs> I think that's the main thing is like it definitely gives the people who want to gripe about stuff something to gripe about that is relatively harmless. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think previously the community has steered itself in a decent direction. I mean, phantoms notwithstanding, everyone sort of looks at that decision with the, the benefit of hindsight. But I think the Sniffer was a decent addition. I think the Allay was a decent addition. And if you notice these 
mobs that they propose are never the make or break like absolute game changer kind of things that that you know people want from an update because those are the kind of things that mojang want to include regardless of what the community says so i don't think yeah. any of them are going to be groundbreaking life-changing mobs but i think they can still provide some interesting utility interesting gameplay and potentially expand upon systems that we already have in game if not provide something new and revolutionary you know i like the idea of non-terrestrial mobs so imaginative stuff like the la like the sniffer uh rather than something like you know flower cows and like th those kind of things uh could it be another ancient mob you know there are a number of different systems you know between archaeology and the sniffer eggs and different ways now that mobs can be introduced into the game that don't necessarily have to be just like something that you wander into walking around the overworld you know are they passive are they rideable are they farmable do they give you new blocks new plants that kind of stuff i i think there's there's a lot of potential we've mentioned before that uh trails and tales laid a lot of groundwork for future expansion you know whether that's archaeology or mobs or you know ancient plants and things like that and i think that that's a great way to to have that option because now when they do a mob vote they can say oh hey this is going to be i you know insert whatever cool elephant bird is going to be you know in the mob vote and oh by the way this is also how you get it it's very similar in mechanics to the sniffer or you know frogs or like whatever it is that they have now that they can introduce as as a mechanic there's a bunch of different things that they can twist to be unique to minecraft and kind of a fun fantasy mob and not have it be like really really basic in terms of how the original like cows and sheep and chickens and stuff are i'm calling it right now if there is a golem option this year it's going to win because right. there yeah. have been copper golems and tough golems in previous uh, votes which have come pretty close but have not quite reached the addition to the game and i do wonder if maybe mojang is holding those back for inclusion in upcoming updates in the same way that they included swamps even though swamps didn't win the biome vote they turned up later in the the wild update as mangrove swamps and and that's when frogs got added and i think there is potential for say they just want to introduce more copper options or they want to introduce the tough golem in this next update anyway they are absolutely free to do that but i think as a community vote goes we won't know for certain whether or not a tough golem or a copper golem makes it into a future update and unless they they announce that uh so before all of that with the mob vote happening i think everybody who's voted for a golem and not managed to get one in previous mob votes is going to be really trying hard to promote the uh the golem option if there is one this year so that's what i'm looking for if there's a golem and it has some you know basic functionality i expect a lot of people are going to be compelled by that i'm also curious to see if those mobs that nearly make it uh end up coming in some other update down the line like talk about a way to bring in some fan service and um use the data that you already have from a previous mob vote like you know the copper golem like coming really close if you ever did like a redstone update or something like that and you just throw in the copper golem because you liked it anyway as a developer yeah. and you know that there's a crew out there like people would without a, without a vote like it just it's just hey well, you know what this was a good idea it didn't get voted in at the time but now that we have the time and the resources, we feel like this is the moment to put in, you know, the copper golem or the glare or whatever it is. And I, I think that's a, an interesting idea. Yeah, a more speculation, I'm sure, on Minecraft Live as uh, the announcements start to roll out. And I'm sure we'll have a lot of fun discussing the various options once they arrive. But in the meantime, this is our Chunk Mail Dispenser episode. This is where we focus on a bunch of community feedback and listener email. So if you'd like to email the show to get your email read on future episodes, because we do one or two every week aside from the Chunk Mail Dispenser, uh, the email address, as always, is spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. And this first email is going to be read by Joel. First one comes in from Taylor M, a landscape artist member of our community, Grindstone Rebalancing. Hey guys, on episode 259 of the Spawn Chunks, there was a discussion being held regarding how grindstones could be reworked to allow only choice enchantments to be removed. It got me thinking about how the second slot of a grindstone is almost entirely unused. Here's my proposal. Place the tool, armor, or what have you in the top slot of the grindstone interface and put a valuable item like a diamond in the second slot. This could act as if the grindstone is getting a temporary buff on its quote-unquote scrubbing ability. 
To keep the idea balanced, no XP would return to the player. Overall, I feel like this could be a solution. Let me know your thoughts. Sincerely, Taylor lost a finger to his newly diamond-coated grindstone. <laughs> you got to be careful about that stuff. Um, so to revise what we know about the grindstone already, the second slot is really if you place two items in there, whether they are enchanted or not, you simply repair those items into a single item, you combine them, and you get a, an additional you know, 5% maximum durability. Um, so it's effectively the same right now as combining those two items in your crafting interface. It's some functionality that they were going to shift over to the grindstone exclusively, but then after a bit of player feedback, they decided to leave that as part of the crafting interface as well. I believe you still get experience back from them if one of the input items was enchanted, similar to just removing the enchantments without combining it to repair the tools. But right now, there is no other functionality for that second slot. It is literally just if you want to combine two tools. I don't know if I've really used a grindstone for much other than maybe removing low enchants from, you know, a pick or something and maybe I found in the end, you know, a rating. And then you just like, nah, this is not where I wanted to be. I'd rather just have a clean slate and, a, and an empty pickaxe and just use the grindstone to just wipe something clean. So I've not really thought about using the grindstone for something this specific. I like the idea in that it makes sense from an upgrade perspective in that you're using harder materials to upgrade the grindstone. And it makes a lot of sense if that diamond that uh, Taylor mentioned is consumed, you know, like if it's costing you something rather than just, you know, a free, you know, enchant or a free buff, like it's actually saying, oh, no, no, this is going to cost you some money, but it's going to allow you to choose, you know, which enchant that you remove. Um, and the thought that I have is that, you know, we tend to go a little bit literal sometimes thinking about like, it's a grindstone. What other hard materials would grind things off uh, a pickaxe? But the other idea is that these are enchantments. This is magical stuff. So what if the material applied to the grindstone is how you, in, you know, select what enchantment you wanted to remove. So if there was a fire aspect on your sword, you really didn't want, if you put blaze powder in the grindstone and use that, to rub away the fire aspect you know I, rub away being a physical term to describe removing a magical enchantment but like you know you, you follow what i mean like yeah it could be more interesting than just you know an interface it could have a little bit more problem solving you know with with the the interface i get then obviously you have to communicate that to the player but they do that fairly well when you have an inventory slot in a crafting table or crafting block like the grindstone and there's usually a silhouette of what could go there. And sometimes they'll rotate, you know, like this could be one of these few things, you know, and you could put any, you know, any one of those items in this spot and it will work or it will do something. Yeah. Yeah. And the, I think um, that that's important, you know, the smithing table is a really good example of that. Now they've mm, got the, yes. the different armor trim materials will cycle through as little outlines in the smithing yeah. table interface. So yeah, that's that's solid. That, that that kind of resolves my major problem with this, which was how do you choose the enchantment? If my sword has mm, six yeah. enchantments and I decide I don't want fire aspect or knockback, how does putting a diamond in there know that that's the enchantment I want to get rid of? And the obvious answer is that, you know, you just click on it from a list, but that doesn't feel very similar to how any other systems in Minecraft work right now. You know, if, if you model it after an existing GUI like the enchantment table or villager trading and you're selecting it like that maybe but it doesn't feel like anything else that we can do and you sort of wonder why are we doing this with the grindstone versus why not just apply those mechanics to the enchantment table and allow you more control over the initial enchanting process um yeah I, I think honestly if it comes to it my main question is how often do we actually want to remove individual enchantments from something outside of curses which i'm pretty sure the system wouldn't allow you to remove anyway like, I, I get that sometimes you want regular protection instead of projectile protection, or you want sharpness instead of Bane of Arthropods, if you've got a really good sword enchantment otherwise, but you just wanted to remove the damage enchantment so that you can make it more generalized or more specific. I think if you're at the point where you can be picky about your enchantments, you're probably at the point where you can re-enchant things or build a custom enchant using books. Um, so it's really more about the early game side of things. And to be quite honest, I'm not that fussed about building the perfect set of gear in the early game anyway, because I know there's always the opportunity to revisit later when I'm slightly more prepared. 
for me it's almost like a an early to mid game kind of enchanting session is when you're you're just going to take what the table gives you to begin with because levels are scarce enough and then you can you know f focus on getting the the fully enchanted gear when you're ready to move up into netherite tier and that kind of stuff I would agree that I think it's an early game want. And I think that some of this feedback comes from a portion of the community that resets a lot, you know, not long-term worlds, but people that go through new worlds on their own all the time, but certainly new worlds whenever they start a new version of Minecraft, right? Yeah. And I think that I can see that crew being the people that would want these kind of early game, you know, things. And this is completely left field. I really haven't thought this through very much, but... I wonder if an idea of using the grindstone to prep a piece of gear or a weapon or a tool for receiving a certain type of enchantment might be a way to do things. Like in the same way that I was mentioning using blaze powder to remove a fire enchantment, what if you use blaze powder on a grindstone to prep a sword to receive a fire enchantment or oh. a chest plate? And so that when you went to the enchantment table, which no one likes the RNG of, you were then more likely to get fire on that item as an enchant because you previously, I don't know, imbued it with whatever material leads it in that direction. I don't know if that's overly complicated. Again, I'm not sure how you communicate that to the player. Like maybe the, you know, the sprite in your inventory just has an orange outline to say, I'm ready for fire, but you've got to do something with me. Like you have to take me to the enchantment table or something. Um, and maybe it just changes the name. Maybe instead of an enchantment, it just says, you know, fire ready or, you know, flame imbued or something like that to indicate, oh, okay, this has got a fire thing on it. I wonder what would happen if I brought it to the, you know, enchantment table. Then you realize, oh, it's everything I look at here. It's just, it's all fire because I did the fire thing first. It's a little bit of trial and error, but it could be interesting. Yeah. I like that idea a lot, like prepping it for a specific enchantment and increasing the likelihood of it. That's, that's smart. I think the the main problem then becomes the nomenclature. It's like, if you say, mm, you know, yeah. this is a, a sharper sword when it's ready to receive sharpness, how do you then convey to the player it's not actually going to deal any more damage yet, you have to enchant it as, as like a secondary step. But like, I, I do like the idea of the grindstone preparing tools or armor for something and like you're you're honing them a little bit. So you got, you got a honed sword instead of a sharpness sword and then you, you put it in the enchantment table and you get sharpness. That's 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 not bad. Like I like that as a, as a concept and it certainly feels tactile enough to work with existing Minecraft systems. I think it's a significant overhaul to the grindstone, but no greater than what we've just seen for the uh, the smithing table. So yeah, not not a bad suggestion. This next email comes in from Empty Empire, and the subject is Lanterns in the Red. Hello, Johnny and Joel. I was listening to your discussion on episode 259 about potentially adjusting the light levels of lanterns, and I was thinking about the crafting recipe for lanterns. I noticed there is a lantern recipe for every torch except the redstone torch. My idea for a redstone lantern, not to be confused with redstone lamp, would be crafted with a redstone torch in a similar way to the other lanterns, and you could change the light level it emits by adjusting the redstone signal strength powering the lantern. Or as an alternative, you could right-click on the lantern to adjust the level. This makes sense to me because the redstone torch does not behave like a regular torch with its ability to power redstone. It would allow players to have better control over their light levels, not to mention a cool red lantern for spooky or modern or sci-fi builds. Would love to hear your thoughts. Empty Empire's light grew too dim after saying lantern too many times. A total of eight. <laughs> I like how it's kind of like Beetlejuice. Like you just, you say it too many times and just bad <laughs> things happen. Lanterns, 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 all the lights turn off. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, like this is a, a neat concept. I, I like the, the notion that every torch has a lantern recipe. Well, there's only two other torches, but like, you know, you might as well, th good things come in threes often, right? Um, so yeah, the idea that a redstone torch would be encased similarly to a lantern, but it shifts the functionality a bit, right? Because we're used to redstone torches being part of a set of power components and empty empire's suggestion here is not that it becomes another power component more that it becomes something that is adjusted with different redstone signal strengths so i like the idea of the redstone signal strength the issue that i have with it is that i wonder if the way that redstone works in the game now if that would really limit where you could put the lantern right like 
does it have to hang below a block that you're solidly powering with redstone and then how does that affect your ceiling or like if you're trying to hang a lantern like i hang lanterns from uh spruce trap doors all the time that look like you know because we can't hang a lantern like we can hang a sign right now uh you're limited as to how you can put places uh you're limited as to how you can put lanterns in places and getting redstone to that would be nigh impossible unless you just want to see redstone everywhere so that to me would be challenging i like the idea of of right clicking and keeping it simple um because i mean some people may not want to write hide the redstone but it seems to be a pretty solid vibe that i you know witness around the community where people want to kind of hide that kind of stuff um so i feel like a simple interface to right click it would be would be good I don't know if I'd want it limited to red. I know that the redstone torch kind of indicates that it would be a redstone, like a red lantern, but I feel like that would limit you in terms of how you could use it decoratively. I feel like a more neutral color would be something that anybody could use. Cottage core, medieval, sci-fi, fantasy, like whatever. I think it would be a little bit nicer that way. It could also, instead of being just another lantern in that shape, maybe it's more cuboid like i wonder to have it be more flexible if you were to add a lantern to indicate both from a visual perspective uh and functional perspective that you can change the light levels of it if it functioned a little bit more maybe not like a mob head because those kind of place themselves funny when you put them on the sides of blocks and things but like that kind of idea like something a little bit more square that could be placed on different faces of things rather than just looking like a iron lantern with a chain on the top of it you know like if it was more flexible then that would mean it would be more flexible from how it could be powered if they wanted to power it in that way kind of like a miniature beacon almost in terms of like the the block model of it if it was slightly square um yeah i i think honestly with it being a lantern style thing it makes more sense to cycle through the light levels by right clicking on it simply because lanterns are going to be hung up in a lot of places and it doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense to send a redstone signal to something that's hanging out the front of a building like you've got to have a, a redstone line going to it from the wall or something and it, you know that that's that's kind of difficult when uh, redstone works the way it currently does so yeah i i do i do think you know we right click on repeaters to change the the, the timings of them like it, it it seems like a a fairly reasonable expectation of a redstone component like this but i sort of wonder because redstone torches give off a max light level of seven right now um and increasing the light level makes sense based on the way torches work when upgrading to lanterns you get slightly more light out of a lantern than you do a torch so maybe the max light level would be eight and that's you know a little bit more commensurate with how a redstone torch functions and it still works for preventing mob spawns post 118 and also means you don't have to go around the horn quite as much with all of the extra light levels of you know something adjustable like that so that's right. uh that's potentially how i would maybe curb the idea not to make it completely replace existing lanterns because i think once you give us something customizable at least if it feels like it's a usable texture like you're suggesting then people are going to just use that and not use any of the other lanterns probably yeah the nookie in our live chat mentioned a light bulb which is you know that's that's pretty good you know like i know it's very modern but i feel like in a lot of you know old builds you can still have something that looks like a light bulb hanging from a chain in the middle of a room still feels old it doesn't feel like very modern you can do some some interesting stuff with that uh i you know when i think my idea at the time was using candles and adding more candles or less candles would increase or decrease yeah. the light level rather than just right clicking on it. it like it was a little bit of an rpg thing and you could do that here with either additional or fewer redstone torches in the lantern could make it more powerful or maybe just redstone dust like maybe you make it and it just starts at one and like the more redstone dust you add to it the stronger it gets that could be interesting too mm -hmm. yeah yeah well this sort of goes hand in hand especially with the uh, modern lighting discussion with our next email so uh, why don't we go straight into that one this one comes in from Mr. Chunch, Neon Signs. Howdy, y'all. This summer, I finished driving down Route 66 with my family. Along the way, I saw a lot of really neat buildings that I would love to build in Minecraft. However, there's just one issue. Neon. There's currently no good way to make neon signs in Minecraft. End rods work all right, but they only connect in straight lines and angles. Glass can work fine if you're building at a large enough scale. 
but at smaller scales, it just doesn't work. What if Minecraft had neon signs? They could be placed on walls and connect to one another. They could also be powered with redstone and maybe even carry a current through them, which would solve the issue of vertical redstone. I would love to hear your thoughts and also if you have any suggestions on how to make neon signs with existing Minecraft features. Mr. Chunch electrocuted himself while trying to wire his neon signs. <laughs> There's a few um, cyberpunk style builders in our community who we see screenshots from occasionally in the Your Base channel or when we do our uh, monthly hangouts. And uh, yeah, they would bite your hand off, I think, if, they, if you offered them neon signs in Minecraft as a, a, a pure feature. Um, I think the main issue really is one of technology level, because in order to make a neon light, you have to effectively compress neon into a tube, right? Which sort of like goes hand in hand with the light bulb discussion. Like light bulbs are typically going to use xenon or argon gas inside of them to sort of isolate everything and allow the filament to glow in the way that it does. And um, yeah, you simply don't have that level of technology in Minecraft except as some sort of fantasy analog. So in order to get lighting, we're relying on, you know, wooden torches and candles, and then obviously the more arcane things you get into stuff like beacons and shroom lights and these sort of mysterious frog lights that you get from introducing a frog to a completely supernatural creature. So I, I think the idea of having something as real world and practical and technological as neon is a little far-fetched for Minecraft, but at least let's talk about the uh, the sort of in-world options, the stuff that we have in the game already, because I think you do still have a few options. I think the main one at a small scale is probably signs with glow ink text on them, right? Like, I know you probably haven't had much opportunity to mess with, like, multicolored glow ink because you're working in, in a medieval town, Joel, but I imagine just for visibility you've used glow ink on a few signs. I think I've used them in some farm builds, you know, like where I'm labeling chests or in uh, like, I feel like I used some signs decorating the uh, geode farm. Like it's all very purple and, you know, bright and stuff like that. I feel like I've at least messed with them in that capacity. I have not done any builds in the modern city since we've got the glowstone, you know, ink for, for signs like that. So I haven't gone down that road. I've seen some cool stuff online where people have added the glow ink to the signs, used symbols rather than words to create kind of like a pattern, and then made only a portion of the sign visible, like by, you know, by having like upside down stairs or slabs or something like that. So that it's a layered effect where the signs are then behind something. And so they, they look like, you know, a strip of LED lights as opposed to an actual, you know, sign with words on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, like the, I, I think the the next scale up is probably you backlight text built with stairs and slabs, right? Like if 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 mm -hmm. if signs yep. are too small a scale for you, and and yeah, I, I think you have the aesthetic limitations of it. it has to be attached to something made of wood, <laughs> um, and and in the case of the sign, the sign usually has to be attached to something. I think you know you use end rods to backlight some, I don't know, lettering in quartz, or I guess if you want more neon light colors then you're probably looking at something like crimson wood or mangrove even that has stairs and slabs and then at least at night it's going to look like it's glowing in some form or another although the front face of it will still be kind of dark um but if you use end rods to connect it to the face of a building then it's going to at least feel like a modern sign anyway and that's where you'd expect to find neon and after that yeah you're looking at the more colorful light sources you're looking at shroom lights and frog lights and beacons surround those with colored glass or even like i think a lot of the, the cyberpunk builders in our community use the trap doors like crimson and acacia trap doors that have the three slats in them that makes it look like the light is glowing from inside um and so yeah there's there's definitely elements like that that can be put together in certain ways but i think on a certain level you're not going to get the level of detail that you want and the player scale that you want from a neon sign without some uh, some pretty intense block modeling i imagine i've seen some banners where people have spelt out letters and then lit them from below and that always has a nice effect you know it, it especially with shaders on it it does kind of have that you know, modern building with like street level floodlights pointing up, that kind of thing. Even if it's on a neon sign, it does sort of have that lit sign vibe to it. One thing that I would suggest would be 
the absolute grind fest of doing some custom Minecraft map art uh, because <laughs> those could be placed directly over light blocks, right? Oh, and they would hide yeah. the whole thing, right? So you could have like the vertical row of frog lights or sea lanterns or something and then just cover the sides and then cover the front with Minecraft maps and you could have the art be whatever you want. It would take you an eon, but it could <laughs> it could look really, really cool. Like you could have, you know, a word snaking through neon, have it, you know how neon signs kind of have those looks where it looks like it goes kind of behind and then comes back out where, you know, it's, it, the, the tubes are going behind the sign or connecting to one another, that kind of thing. And it kind of goes dark and then comes back and looks like light again, because they always look really different when they're off in the daylight compared to what they look like at night. And you could, I mean, if you have the time, you could do some really cool stuff with that. I, I've not gone into it, but you know, if you made them in some place in the end where you're way off over the void, that saves you from placing a ton of black, right? Like you could, you could just do the straight up, you know, um, color bits and, and see how that looks, you know, uh, in the end and go from there. That would be one way to do it. Um, I think that, you know, it's not a, it's too bad we can't die end rods because you could probably get a little ways with a slightly larger build. Like if you could die end rods and they could connect to one another in different ways, then that could be kind of cool and still very Minecrafty in that you'd have to build big. Like, you know, your words would still have to be like, you know, three blocks by five blocks, something like that. But you could at least have a big, you know, department store sign or something like that made out of neon. But I think it was you that suggested that you wanted chains to connect in a different way in a previous episode like horizontally so like they would actually make a corner I yeah if yeah if they were able to it, bend at 90 degrees and yeah yeah if n rods could do that that would be really cool like you could just have these things floating in space and as you connected them if you turned an angle and went you know up it would connect in the same way that rails do when you're on the ground like yeah if, if they did that then that that could be really fun and if they added all the colors like if you could dye you know, end rods, the 16 colors that are currently in Minecraft, then, I mean, think about all the beautiful rainbow designs that people could do. Like you could <laughs> yeah. do, a, you could do a lot. It, it, it all depends on how they connect. Now I have to remind myself that I use a resource pack that removes the gray end to the end rod. So when I think end rod, I think a nice clean white cylinder. I don't think about the little purple bit at the end, at the yeah, end, at the yeah. end of it. Well, uh, we have one more email that we'll touch on, and then I think we'll save the last email for the render distance. So once again, if you're a patron, you get even more listener email on the Chunk Mail dispensers. But this last one comes in from Corporal Narwhal. Hey there, Joel and Johnny. I've been a long-time listener of the show, and I'd like your opinion on something. Normally, whenever a new Minecraft update is announced, I follow the snapshots very closely, often making a new world every week just to explore the new content. However, life has been busy recently, and I haven't sat down to play in a long-term survival world in about nine months or so. I've also hit a bit of Minecraft burnout. What do you think about waiting until the update drops to play again, so that I can enjoy new content fully all at once, instead of finding all of it out in the months before? Sorry if this idea is a bit incoherent. Thanks for the wonderful podcast, and congrats on four-plus stacks of episodes. Corporal Narwhal waited almost patiently enough for Minecraft Live 2024. I mean, you you can satisfy your thirst for up-to-date Minecraft news, knowledge, and opinions by listening to a podcast. <laughs> yes. I've heard. If only there was some sort of show that would mm. <laughs> keep you in the loop without having to play. Now, I, yeah. I, I think, honestly, it's a good idea. We, it's the kind of thing that you and I... Joel don't really contemplate because playing and podcasting about Minecraft is a significant chunk of our careers at this yes, point. Yeah. But I think as a casual player, there is plenty of reasons for you to step away from Minecraft for a while, get your, get your legs back, uh, and then come back to Minecraft with um, a little bit more uh, fresh eyes. And while obviously looking at the update cycle we have right now, we when did trails and tales actually come out was it like june or july it was it june was, it was so, june so we're looking at probably nine months from minecraft live announcing what 1.21 is going to be until the update actually arrives so yeah you are looking at another nine months away at which point if you haven't played in a long-term survival world for nine months that's 18 months away from the game year and a half if you reckon you can deal with not really playing minecraft for a year and a half then by all means do that and come back. I think a lot of people have this kind of feeling about Trails and Tales because it had some good individual features but didn't have the focus that something like the Nether update did. So 
it can feel in a way like not much has changed, even though a lot has, because a lot of the features are spread out across worlds and are small features that impact, you know, very specific things. So I can understand that as a reason why people feel like they're drifting away from Minecraft lately and that there hasn't been a significant content update because it's not something with a unified theme like the Nether update or like an end update might be. And if I'm if it sounds like I'm harping on an end update right now, trust me, it's just a convenient example. Um, but like if that happens, that's going to be a really great time to return to Minecraft and experience a bunch of new content, provided that you're the kind of person who likes to go to the end. And I think that if you're, you know, feeling the burnout on Minecraft, I mean, I know I do sometimes, maybe more specifically to certain projects, but I still absolutely feel, you know, like I want to branch out and play more games and do all that kind of stuff. And I think that we've mentioned this on, on the show before, but when you're feeling that, it's good to be aware of it. It's good not to push it because if you play other things, watch other things, read other things, you're just going to refill that creative tank. So when it does come time to return to Minecraft, you're going to have more ideas and you know what to do with, because as you been you know we heard earlier driving down route 66 with your family and you're just seeing all this cool stuff that you want to build in minecraft that you would not have had that idea for if you weren't driving down route 66 not playing minecraft right and i and i think that you know as an example that's a really good way to kind of remind us that you know stepping away from these creative games is a really good way to recharge your batteries you obviously love the game i'm sure you're going to hear about the new things one way or another whether you're looking it up online listening to this podcast or another one watching streamers that you like that kind of stuff but waiting to experience the full release doesn't mean you have to quit minecraft entirely like you can just play minecraft as is now as it suits you when you want to and then just don't play the snapshots you know i i don't do snapshot streams anymore i used to and I found that between this show and the snapshot streams, while I did have some hands on to talk about stuff on the show, I, I found that when the release happened, I was less excited because I'd already been messing around with it. And those snapshots were separate from my current projects and current worlds. I felt like I was being pulled away from those. And I also was rushing through the snapshots to try to get to the new content as I was trying to do it in survival because playing in creative is like, well, that's not how I play the game anyway. So experiencing those new features in creative wasn't really experiencing them. It was just kind of like showing them on stream. And so I just don't do it anymore, but I still play Minecraft all the time. You know, uh, you can always return when, you know, your creativity strikes uh, and you want to get in there, you may also find anybody like me that has a long-term world, I'll get sparked by hearing something is coming and thinking, oh, I should maybe prep for that. You know, like for example, the all the new bamboo blocks. One of the things I did as a break from Westo was I built a temporary bamboo farm because I wanted to have a lot of bamboo on hand when the update dropped. So as you keep in touch with what's going on, you might find yourself being pulled into Minecraft closer to the release of the new update because there's stuff that you want to do to make yourself ready in your long-term world for that yeah definitely i think that's that's uh, really good advice it may be better for you to experience some of the new stuff once you've already been established in a survival world so yeah dropping back in a month or two before the update arrives might give you enough time to prepare your spawn area unless there's a couple of new biomes that you really want to spawn next to in a, in a brand new survival world or something but I think another thing about staying away from snapshot news and, and that kind of thing is that there is inevitably a little bit of negativity around that. There's a bit of that kind of community sentiment that where somebody has to play devil's advocate and argue against something being a good idea. And so you also skip out on some of that and you, re you resist the notion that your opinion of the update is going to be colored by somebody else's opinion of it. And I think that's a, that's a fairly attractive prospect for me as well. <laughs> like not worrying too much about other people's negativity, weighing down my idea of how much fun I think I'm going to have. Um, ov obviously the reverse is also true and you miss out on other people getting really excited for an update so yeah potentially i'd say if you want to tune into minecraft live this year just get an idea of what's coming and then go okay i'll put that in the back pocket and save it for later then you know i think you'll get a a decent experience of that because you'll know a little bit about what's coming but probably not the full picture
And I think on that note, we're probably going to wrap up this episode of The Spawn Chunks. Thank you, folks, so much for listening. You can find more information about the show and links to some of the stuff that we've talked about today at thespawnchunks.com. The music for the show was composed by me, and The Spawn Chunks is proud to be a listener-supported podcast. If you're getting some value out of the show, why not consider putting some value back in? You can do that at patreon.com slash thespawnchunks. Pledging at any level there gets you an invite to our patrons-only Discord chat. You can participate in the live recording, which happens in Discord every week. We have our monthly Minecraft audio hangouts where people share their own builds and what they've been up to in Minecraft that month. And we've got a quarterly hangout coming out in October if you're interested in the behind the scenes facts and figures of how the podcast is doing. We also have 323 patrons, which is up one from last week. There is always room for more, so feel free to sign up if you want to come on over. Special thanks go out to our content engineer patrons, Hunter555, Jumbo Sale, Mind Trip Media, Party Voyager, and Yitz. Thank you all for your support on this episode. Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. You can find us at The Spawn Chunks on Twitter and Instagram. Personal recommendations are by far the best way to share the podcast. Just poke a friend in the arm from a safe distance and let them know that they can listen on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Be sure to leave a rating and review on your favorite platform. You can email the show at spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. Please use that email address. The RSS feed is linked at the spawnchunks.com, and the patron-only RSS feed is on the Patreon page. That's where you can listen to the render distance, the extended version of the podcast. My name is Johnny, but online I go by Pixlriffs. You can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash Pixlriffs, where the Minecraft Survival Guide is currently in its third season. I also stream three days a week on Twitch, where I do behind-the-scenes work for the Survival Guide, and I'm the voice of the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, which you can find through a quick YouTube search. Aside from that, I'm at Pixlriffs on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? Everything that I'm doing online can be linked through joelduggan.com, including the Citadel Cafe, my other podcast about sci-fi and fantasy entertainment. I recorded with Stephen ESC last week and covered the first five episodes of Star Wars Ahsoka. Great conversation there. I'm Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I stream Thursday through Sunday, mostly building Minecraft on the Citadel server with live Legos on Fridays. And we finished the motorized Legos this week and are now on to the Ultimate Collector Series X-Wing starting this Friday, and I cannot wait. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite, and there's a light at the end of the Redstone Wire.